Welcome, Explorer. If you're seeing this, it means that you're one of the select people who have been able to noclip into the back rooms. You ought to give yourself a pat on the back for that. You're one of the winners here. You just made it to level one, the habitable zone. You take a deep breath, sucking in a waft of thick, metallic air that tastes like an oil slick. Your first impression is that it looks a little like an abandoned warehouse that's seen better days, or one of those spooky parking complexes you were always afraid to walk through after late shifts at work. But here, fear isn't an option. It's like Dune. Fear is the mind killer. You lose your head here, and you might also lose your life. That's why you decide to venture cautiously into this new concrete mess of an environment, propelled by a mixed curiosity and the hunger nagging at your belly. There has to be something here. It isn't the same featureless nightmare that the last place was. Maybe here, you can find some well-deserved goodies. You continue to walk as the concrete world reels past you. The longer you spend here, the more reality starts to feel slightly altered. You notice that it's oddly cold in here, so much so that in some areas, deposits of mist hang close to the floor. In other places, the mist has thickened into slick sheens of condensation or dark, reflective puddles on the ground. The wrongness of a place like Level 1 isn't as obviously evident as Level 0, but over time, the creeping sense of dread seems to rise and rise. With every open space, illuminated by flickering halogen lights up ahead, with every long, dim corridor with phrases like Welcome to Hell and No One Escapes spray-painted on the walls. With every hall dotted with great concrete pillars that could be hiding anything, you start to feel your heart rate rise. You begin to wonder, weren't there meant to be people on level 1? You were sure that you read that back in the Manila room on level 0. The document had said, Level 1. Reaching this level should be your next goal. Our primary base, which is one of the safest locations for you, is located here. Level 1 takes the appearance of an infinite warehouse stocked with crates full of supplies. You haven't seen any of those mythical supply crates yet, but you're holding out hope. Because what else can you do? That thing about the primary base was also encouraging. That means other humans are out here, possibly even in force. Safety in numbers. Wouldn't that be a fine thing? Your stomach grumbles painfully again and you keep walking. After what could have been hours of more walking, your heart flutters. You see a person in the distance, standing beneath a flickering light. And look at that. They're standing over what looks like a crate of supplies. At long last, it seems like your luck is turning in the back rooms. You break into a steady clip and make a beeline for the only human you've seen in days. You call out, saying you're here and you're human too. You can already taste the energy bars and the delicious almond water. It'll taste so good. But you can't help but notice the person leaning over the crate in front of you isn't moving. They aren't reacting to anything you're saying, like if they're a store window clothes mannequin just fixed into place. In an instant, you feel this unassailable dread wash over you. You grind your heels into the ground and come to an abrupt stop. As if sensing you now, the stranger jolts to life and begins to turn. There's something terribly wrong with his face, namely the fact that he literally doesn't have one. Just a smooth, slightly domed, egg-like face, with no features whatsoever. Moving almost robotically, the faceless man begins to walk towards you. You scream and run as fast as you can, perhaps sensing wisely that there is safety in the light. The entity you just ran into is a being commonly documented in the back rooms, known as a faceling. These frightening tricksters come in a variety of terrifying flavors, and if you don't want your time in the back rooms to be cut abruptly short, you're best off staying away from them at all costs. Not that you need to be told. You're already running for the hills, not even bothering to look where you're going, taking entryways and corridors at random, doing whatever you can to put greater and greater distance between you and it. By the time you actually feel safe enough to stop, you're in another place you don't recognize. And the faceling is nowhere to be seen. Thank goodness for that, right? But you realize there is no endpoint, no absolute salvation or safe zone. You just need to keep wandering and hope you don't encounter something even more dangerous. Here's the thing. 
There are, theoretically, plenty of actual, real-life human beings trapped on level 1 of the backrooms. The problem is, each level is constructed out of millions of miles of alien geometry, not bound by the same laws of physics that dictate our home dimension. You can travel through these haunted halls for a thousand lifetimes and never encounter another person. It's all pure chance. The only thing that matters is surviving the next moment, because that next moment is never a guarantee. Because when you're searching for salvation in the depths of the back rooms, you have to remember that there are always other things searching for you. You continue walking, still trying to catch your breath after your recent escape. You're so desperate for some food or some almond water, the drink that's allegedly inexplicably all over the back rooms. You're even hungrier and thirstier after the run. Damn it, why did you even want to come here again? Was life really so terrible before? You enter another warehouse storage room filled with large boxes, with rotted planks barely held together by rusty nails. More condensation here, and more of those large, dark puddles on the floor. That's when an idea crosses your mind. If the mist is safe to breathe, then presumably it's just water, right? And that means, in puddle form, it should also be safe to drink. Granted, you weren't exactly eager to slurp water out of a puddle, but these are the kinds of things you need to do in order to avoid a horrific death via dehydration. You pick the puddle that looks the least dark, settling on one that seems to have a slightly silvery quality to it. Not ideal, but it would do. You dropped to your knees and leaned in towards the puddle, preparing to swallow your pride and swallow some of this nasty floor water. You wish you were braver about this kind of thing, but believe it or not, your hesitation actually saved your life this time around. You're about an inch away from the silvery water when, in an instant, it takes the form of a terrible grasping hand and reaches for you. Your reflexes pull you back from the wriggling fingers, scrambling back on your butt as the puddle seems to reshape and transform. It had never been real water. It was actually another common hostile entity in the back rooms, known as a duller. The reason that even things as innocent as puddles can't be trusted in the nightmare space. Dullers are large, devious monsters that function as ambush predators. They take on a semi-liquid state and imitate an innocent puddle on the ground, just waiting for some unlucky explorer to come and stick their feet where they shouldn't. At that point, it'll latch onto its victim and never let go dragging them into its form and ruthlessly devouring them. Very few people who come into contact with a duller in their liquid form live to tell the tale, so you just nabbed yourself a hell of a lucky break from an otherwise certain doom. But you're not out of the woods yet. The duller now in its physical form begins lumbering towards you. You've got no time to recover. You need to get up and move right now. You spring up to your feet and run for it before the duller has a chance to go for round two. You keep running, room to room, hallway to hallway, through this warehouse straight out of perdition. It's exhausting. Is there literally anywhere you can relax in this place, even for a moment? If you're lucky enough to survive this horrifying episode, you can bet your ass that the future PTSD is already in the mail. But as you're running, you suddenly stop, noticing that you're in an oddly dark corridor. The lights flicker on only occasionally, giving brief moments of illumination. The active fear that came from running from the duller begins to melt away, instead replaced by the icy dread that you've come to associate with the many ambiguous terrors of the back rooms. You just know something terrible is about to come round the corner. You just didn't quite expect that feeling to be completely literal in its accuracy. With each flash of light, you see a door squeaking ajar and something moving behind it. There's a low, guttural growling noise, something primal and vicious. You get the sense that whatever's behind there, it is a truly dangerous predator. It enters, beginning with a tangle of filthy, matted hair that obscures whatever face might be underneath. With each flash of light, you see a little more. It has human skin, each of its limbs seemingly oddly human in isolation, but the configuration is all long. Its body is built almost like a hairless dog, a badly assembled jigsaw puzzle made of human parts. Also, it's hungry, and you look like food. You naturally turn to run, and it gallops after you on all fours, growling and snarling. While this living nightmare is new to you, it is a very familiar creature for veteran explorers and survivors of the backrooms. They're referred to as hounds, 
dangerous bestial monsters that hunt down survivors to either devour them or infect them. That's right, infect them. Because these creatures carry a dangerous pathogen, often referred to as the Hound Virus. It's fast-acting, can spread through bites, and leads to a horrifically painful transformation that converts human beings into hounds themselves. Of course, that fate doesn't sound all that fun to you, so you run like hell. Remind us why you wanted to come here again. Don't get us wrong, we know bills, rent, the job market, and student loans suck, but there's gotta be a better alternative than this. Adrenaline carries you where more conventional energy fails to step up to bat. You can hear the growl of the hound as it follows you for about 20 solid minutes of relentless running. It feels like a miracle when you enter a new room and the growling behind you gives out. You're safe again, for now. And for now never seems to last as long as you would hope it would in the back rooms. You think to yourself, panting and on the edge of tears, born from a mix of immediate fear and low, nagging hopelessness, it isn't fair, it just isn't fair. That's when you see it, parked about a foot in front of you. A big, beautiful supply crate made out of a relatively pristine looking wood. After the trio of horrors you've seen today, it feels like seeing the pearly gates. You approach with ravenous intensity and pry the lid off the crate with your fingers. Inside enough almond water and energy bars to last for days, you eat and drink your fill. It's the first time in a long time that you feel close to happy. Perhaps with this small light in the darkness, you'll have the strength to keep going, but nothing can prepare you for what you'll encounter next. After taking your fill from one of the supply crates, you take a moment just to breathe and assess your next options. You've been running through the halls of this hell like a headless chicken. It's time for you to calm down and get methodical. Otherwise, you might get lost in level one forever. Don't you want to at least find your way to level two before you bite the big one? You shove as many energy bars and bottles of almond water into your bag as you possibly can, just to avoid the encroaching horror of starvation and dehydration later. It's a little less exciting than some of the other ways you can die around here, but it's the most common way to go. Even if you're the kind of supreme badass who could kick most backroom entities through the nearest wall, you're still vulnerable to starving to death. So you continue your journey through level one, searching for some kind of way out. You read somewhere that finding your way through the right aperture can lead you to no clipping into level two. You don't know much of what's supposedly down there, but so far level one has been an absolute nightmare. So surely can't be much worse than that, right? Of course, you will come to regret thinking that. As you pass through warehouse floor after warehouse floor, corridor after corridor, you see something miraculous. Another human being dressed in cobbled together tactical clothes and wielding a machete, recently stained with black blood from some unknown source. But seeing black blood on this stranger's blade is definitely better than seeing red. The person smiles, raising the machete and asking if you're human. When you say yes, which to be fair he already knew, he lowers his blade and beckons you over for a handshake. The stranger tells you his name is James, and that he's a raider. This frightens you. You've played a whole bunch of Fallout games, so when you think raider, you think bloodthirsty psychopath that will kill you and steal your stuff. But this is only because you're not that familiar with some of the factions at play in the back rooms. Of course, there are far too many groups and factions to discuss right here, but all you need to know about the Raiders is that they're big fans of freedom. They hope for the backrooms to stay independent, rather than being ruled by the same systems of greed and corruption that rule the world outside. They want the backrooms to remain the strange new frontier that it was always meant to be, for those who actually want to be there, at least. James the Raider tells you that they lost the rest of their team in a scramble after they were chased by a whole pack of hounds. He even managed to kill one, hence the black blood on his machete. He's established a camp nearby, and if you want to come camp with him overnight, you're more than welcome. There's safety in numbers. You decide to take him up on his offer and camp out with James the Raider for the night. Perhaps in the morning, the two of you can go out on a hunt for an exit or other explorers the next morning. He's busted up an empty supply box and used the planks of wood as firewood. It's clear that this guy has been here much longer than you. You hope with enough time, you might be able to learn from this man. Maybe with the knowledge imparted to you, the back rooms might become the fun, exciting adventure you hoped it would be. James says he'll take first watch, cleaning the blood off his machete with a rag. You can get some well-earned sleep at long last, 
and given how exhausted you feel, you welcome it. But it's a rough, uneasy sleep. You keep having dreams filled with strange images, huge, hissing metal pipes snaking off into infinity, glowing eyes and teeth in the darkness, looking at you, getting closer and closer. What does it mean? You haven't encountered anything like it in the back rooms before, so you have no idea where this frightening image comes from. But the eyes and glowing teeth keep getting closer and closer and closer. When they eventually reach you, you bolt upright, awakening with a scream. You're breathing heavily, drenched in sweat. The fire is down to its last dying embers. You're alive. You're safe. It's okay. It's no surprise that hanging around with the monsters in these otherworldly locales would lead to strange dreams. You look around for James, but you can't see him. Panic begins to tiptoe down your spine, vertebrae to vertebrae. Did he leave? Did a monster get him? All these thoughts race through your mind until a figure begins approaching you from the shadows. At first, you're afraid. Could it be a duller or a faceling? Nope, just James. You couldn't be more relieved. You ask him if he's okay, and he just flatly replies, hello. You pause for a moment, a little confused by his response. But before you can ask another question, he simply repeats, hello, once more in the same flat tone. You rise to your feet, realizing now that something is terribly wrong. James just stares at you. There is something terribly wrong with him. When the light above flickers on slightly, you start to notice how incredibly dead his skin looks. It doesn't look like his skin. It looks like something else wearing his skin. And in this regard, you're completely right. While you slept, James was attacked by an entity known as a skin stealer, which, I mean, come on. It's in the name. You can probably guess what a dude called the Skin Stealer did to your new friend here. There's no time to grieve. The Backrooms is an easy come, easy go kind of place. All you can do now is survive. You jump to your feet and charge into the nearest hallway as the shambling Skin Stealer wearing what used to be James chases after you. The Backrooms may be a horrific place, but at least it's giving you plenty of opportunities to work on your cardio. You didn't do nearly enough of that back on the outside. You break into a mad dash until the noises of the Skin Stealer disappear behind you. You're barely even thinking. But when your mind slows down and resumes normal operations, you realize you're somewhere different. You're in a long, dark hallway, threaded with giant, hissing pipes like metal arteries. On the inside, you feel cold, but on the outside, you're sweltering. You recognize this place, exactly as it was in your dreams. Congratulations, Explorer. You just made it to level two. Want to stay tuned for the next exciting exploration into the Backrooms as we delve deeper and deeper into this liminal abyss? Be sure to subscribe to Backrooms Explained and turn on notifications so you never miss another expedition.